Old lady. Old lady, where's my healing? Where's my healing? God damn it! Ana's ult, the roids, can combo with teammates' other ultimates to deal additional damage, while making said teammate take less damage. Ana's drug rifle is equipped with drug injection technology so advanced that it can distinguish between friend or foe. She has the ability to give precision healing to any teammate from a distance, provided you hit your shots. This range benefit comes with a downside. Ana has no movement abilities per se. On ADS, she can hip fire a slower moving projectile while ADS. It is hit scan. She's not completely helpless in the damage dealing department either, as her rifle, when striking enemies, deals a brief damage over time effect that can finish off squishy or low health targets. Three in a row will take down typical 200 health characters like Soldier. Even the occasional Farah might think twice about peeking with an astute Ana on the board. Another important part of her kit is a purple flurp grenade that gives teammates a much needed health boost and healing bonuses while also doing a little bit of damage to enemies and giving them a debuff that denies them healing altogether. With the right timing, Ana can use this grenade to help her team shut a character down, even a tank. Ana also has a hugely useful shutdown tool with the sleep dart that can be used to deny flankers that would otherwise be a big threat to her or her team, and it can be used to shut down ultimates that might otherwise completely blow a team fight wide open. Ash is one of the more memorable examples of a hitscan character in the game. Her primary lever action, Model 18, whatever the fuck, has a fast firing hip fire that's useful at close range, and her right clicked ADS mode fries enemies with consecutive headshots, useful at medium to long range. Ash is one of those characters that'll make you feel like you are personally responsible for losing the team fight because you missed that one last finishing shot on the Mercy, but if you're rootin', tootin', aimin', and shootin', then Ash is good for you. Yes, headshots are extremely important with this character, but when you're first starting out, just make sure to eliminate the target. Don't overcompensate trying to hit a headshot that you're not going to hit when three to four body shots will do the trick. As long as you're getting people off of the board like healers and the occasional caught out DPS, you're doing your job, even if it doesn't look as pretty. Ash is a great pick to apply pressure to the infamous Mercy Farah combo, but fast movers like Genji and Tracer are going to be tough to combat. Her playstyle is that of a medium to long range marksman that needs to stay by her team or somewhere safe. Ash isn't completely helpless in terms of that though. Her coach gun can outright finish off weak opponents close to her with that big ass aiming circle, but it also moves her away and her aggressor backwards as well. It's also used for movement techs and can launch her up to much needed higher ground. Her dynamite ability can be shot right out of the air in front of her. It's good for flushing bad guys out of buildings, but it gets the most amount of usage in team fights where its fire effect can melt the enemy snowball, softening up targets and giving your team a much better fighting chance. Ash's Ash stand, Bob, runs to the direction you point, flinging enemies in the air for easy headshots before coming to a stop at a wall to shoot at enemies like a turret. Bob is kind of like a sixth teammate and can be buffed by allies and debuffed by enemies alike. He's capable of contesting nice objectives too, so use it in a pinch if you need that extra overtime. You can also send Bob off a cliff on accident, which is just rude. Don't do that. Heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. Baptiste is a hit scan healer, which sounds kind of funny because you'd think a healer would be the last character in the game to have such a trait, but nope. Baptiste's weird combination gun healy orb grenade launcher thing is a hit scan weapon and it packs a serious punch. His healing output is quite good as well and doable from a distance. Right clicked healy grenades do 50 hit points with explosive hits and 70 with direct hits. So if you can help it, you should be hitting people directly. But the big thing here is that Baptiste is really, really solid in big snowball brawler bunker like compositions where his heals can be spread out to his teammates more easily. I'm talking Rhines and Roadhogs. With dive comps utilizing a lot of forward and horizontal mobility, it's a little tougher because he's not going to be able to keep up. However, with the use of moon boots, he can get to high ground very quickly, and sometimes that can close the gap. You shouldn't sit in the back like an Ana, though. That's her job. Bap has two big, big group healing abilities that further aid him in this job. A heal over time ability with shift, and arguably the most important part of his kit, his immortality field ubiquitously referred to as lamp. The lamp is basically a giant fuck-off diva card. Baptiste can launch this thing in the middle of an ult while you and your teammates basically vibe in its radius and throw up a middle finger, but it can be shot and destroyed and doesn't last forever. Just long enough for you to turn around and heal your nearly slain friendlies. Timing is everything with Baptiste. Another ability like this is his ult, the bullet booster. It's a wall of huge damage boost for anybody on your team who shoots through it. Bap can essentially use this thing to powerful effect to basically snipe down squishy targets with headshots. It will 
win you a team fight. Your teammates can throw ults through it too. Your mercy can damage boost you while you shoot through it. Imagine that. Position this ability in a way that your entire team can get some value out of it. No pressure. Like I said, it can win and lose you the team fight. Seriously, be very deliberate with this thing's placement. It's that freaking useful. It can also boost your healing too. You're gonna read what's on my sign. It starts right here. Bruh! Brig uh, fuck it. Briggs less of an FPS character and handles a lot more like a paladin in World of Warcraft. She has a healing effect and a radius around her, provided she's in the front line, smacking enemies with her flail, bashing them with her shield, or sniping people with her whip shot. The flail doesn't do enough damage most of the time to regularly eliminate opponents, but it does enough to keep people at a distance and, more importantly, heal teammates. Brig distributes up to three Healy blocks for teammates that give them 110 health over two seconds. Like Reinhardt, she has a deployable shield on her person, but it's more for personal defense than it is protecting teammates, although sometimes it can certainly do that. What's important is that it gives her a ton of survivability and makes her difficult to pick off of the board from flankers, and that ability to stay alive and keep up her healing output is very strong. Briggs' ult is pretty simple in its design, but very powerful, providing a big overhealth buff as well as increased movement speed to herself and nearby teammates. Due to her healing aura procced by damage dealing, she's very good in death ball comps where she can fight at the front line, but she is very vulnerable to Sombra, wherein she can't really help the team at all with her abilities short-circuited. Her whip shot, snipe, and shield bash provide a little bit of knockback too, giving your death ball some extra breathing room when needed. Your main source of healing should come from doing damage, so get up close and personal and smack some fools around. Howdy. Name's Cassidy. I know what you're thinking. Wasn't your name something else? Nope. It definitely wasn't. No, my name's always been Cassidy. Like, like Butch Cassidy and the... Oh, who am I kidding? You never watch movies like that unless your old man was really into Western or something like that. Yep. That's what it is. Now I did have an old name. But that alias is long gone. It definitely wasn't the name of him. I'd tell you the story of Cassidy and the Moira DPS kid, but it would piss me off too much. Cassidy might be a hitscan DPS and only has six shots in his revolver, but he's actually capable of fighting with his team a lot like Soldier 76 might. He's not particularly suited to going off on his own since he's not super mobile. Cassidy excels as a watchman for his healers picking off flankers or the occasional tank that gets too close. All of which he can DPS down very efficiently, especially with headshots. The revolver has a typical default fire, but you can also fan the hammer on low health, up close targets to finish them off. Cassidy also has a magnetic, yes, I said magnetic, grenade that's a big difference maker in a duel. And low health, skinny ass targets like DMEC Diva don't have to be finished with left click when you can just do this. The dodge is an instant reload slash reload cancel as well and can sometimes come in handy as a mix-up, but you shouldn't act like it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. Cassidy is not great for solo plays like Genji, unless he's got his high noon alt up, in which case, yeah, maybe he can pull off a big flank, but I'd recommend going to high ground to use that instead. The ability is basically a chargeable insta-kill. Gain line of sight on a target long enough, and you'll be able to one-shot them. Red means dead. Cassidy is a versatile gunfighter that makes up for his lack of mobility with really, really solid damage output and the ability to deal with flankers that get too close to your healers without even needing to aim at all. What the fuck? D.Va rewards aggressive, in-your-face gameplay with a kit centered around blocking damage for brief periods of time while using her mobile rocket boosters to get up close and shotgun squishy targets to death. With no barriers like Ryan or Sigma, she relies on pressuring opponents so much that they are forced to deal with her or give up map control. Kind of like Winston. Snipers are especially hard countered by D.Va, and she adds a well-rounded X-Factor to a Farah Mercy combo that's commonly counterpicked by Widow or Ash. The bread and butter of D.Va's kit is her defense matrix. It's a big field in front of D.Va that quite literally zaps projectiles out of the air. It doesn't last very long though, so it's not suited to sustain damage control like a Reinhardt barrier. It's more for bursts, like Farah alts. All of her damage is done from up close, including her mini rockets. So it may be common for new players to overextend and get themselves caught. So it's important to know when to engage and when to disengage. Diva farms damage to go for her ult, which sends her mech forwards to wipe anybody caught within its line of sight. She calls in another mech and repeats the cycle all over again. On attack, she's suited to pushing the envelope on squishy, out-of-place enemies, and on defense, she excels in close-range engagement objectives like capture points. At the moment, Zebra is currently the only player that can play Doomfist. Nobody else is allowed to play Doomfist. I did murder him. 
Thanks. Echo is Apple's newest foray into the combat drone market with the backing of Joe Biden's America to maintain air superiority from far mercy combos. That's not really her design in a nutshell, but I like bringing Echo for that if we already have a hit scan on the team. She's a very versatile character that can do lots of things. She can flank and pick healers from the back line, but she can also support her team in a death ball. Her flight ability in combination with her passive ability to glide, a lot like Mercy, gives her a vantage point other GPSs aside from Farah don't really have. Right click sends a bunch of explodable sticky bombs that are great for softening up targets so that you can finish them with an ultralight beam. Am I still allowed to make that joke? I, I, that finishing laser only really works on targets below 50% health. Do not use this thing as an initiator. It is exclusively designed to get you that elimination on a low health target. Her primary fire is actually pretty potent too, especially with headshots, although you will need to lead your target a little bit. Knowledge of the Overwatch roster is important to get the most out of Echo, since her ult duplicate is designed for her to farm a bit of damage very quickly, and then get another ult entirely into the fray. Knowledge of team comps and what counters what will help you here. She's an interesting character that rewards calculated risk-taking and positioning with her ability to fly around the map. And she's not a bad duelist herself either. Don't overuse your abilities here. Manage cooldowns to the best of your ability so that you'll have the laser beam to finish off foes and the flight ability to get out of sticky situations. <laughs> I'm fucking dead, dude. I'm fucking dead, dude. I'm fucking dead. <laughs> Guys, later. Genji will be good for two weeks, a couple of streamers will pop off with him, and then Blizzard will go, no. So enjoy it while you can. Genji's one of those characters that you either pop off with and feel like an anime character, or get your ass absolutely handed to you and feel like an anime character. His shurikens, either three in a line with left click, or three in a horizontal fan with right click, do decent damage from mid-range, and are easy to farm your ultimate with, but it doesn't mean Genji is suited to frontline fighting. Flanking and harassment are your primary objectives with Genji. Especially picking off caught out healers when the opportunity arises. He doesn't have the quick escapability of Tracer, although it's still respectable with his dashing attack. That dashing attack is really important. You can use it to quickly dive in and engage, as well as to escape from fights you're not going to win. The dash resets with eliminations, not even necessarily final blows. That means if there's an opportunity to take a target down, you should use it. Get that quick 180 flick turnaround with your fan right click and throw in a melee for good measure too. Remember that the cooldown resets no matter what ability is used, so make good usage of it. Throwing Genjis and MLG Pro Genjis are defined by the timing of his deflect, which gives him a brief moment of survivability and even killing power since the ability reflects everything up to Cassidy ults back at your opponent. Use it to close the gap and go for the kill or to disengage and retreat safely. Genji has a double jump and wall climbing ability that give him a great deal of verticality in terms of positioning. This emphasis on movement is what makes his ultimate useful, which can basically insta-kill squishy targets with a button press, but he's still just as vulnerable with this ability as he is without it, so you need to get your timing exactly right for it to get that coveted team wipe. Done properly though, you'll send everybody back to their spawn. He's a very high skill cap hero that rewards good game knowledge and important timing. Why we're dead. Oh. Ash is Sorry, on, on the roof. Sorry, Ash is on the roof. Ash on the roof. Hanzo's a sniper character. Granted, he's not as long range focused as Widow, but he still does a metric crap ton of damage via headshots with his bow and can one shot a lot of squishy targets he comes across with a well placed arrow at full knock. Watch out for snipers. That was. Nice. You shouldn't really be engaging targets without a full knock unless the kill is guaranteed and at short range. Hanzo's ability to climb walls puts him in high ground positions that gives him a safe vantage point to rain medieval artillery on bad guys down below. His E, Storm Arrows, is useful for getting a quick amount of burst damage onto targets that are up close and need to go down quickly. Although, if the target is moving predictably, a well-placed headshot can do the trick. His information gathering recon arrow allows him to get a beat on enemy positions and prepare for the upcoming fight by walling anybody who is in its effective radius. You should use it as much as you can. Hanzo's famous ultimate is a giant area denial ability that goes through walls, dealing damage to anybody caught within the tube of the twin dragon. It's great for team fights and can disrupt the positioning of the enemy with one simple click, but it needs to be timed appropriately. Use your recon arrow to see if you have a good opportunity to use your ultimate since you don't want to waste it. Overall, Hanzo is great at harassing enemies from unsuspecting positions with his ability to traverse walls, which you should do as much as you can in combination with the short dash ability that lets you traverse the map in ways other DPSs can't, for the most part. Outback, big Australia. 
Junker Queen is an in-your-face raid boss type of tank with a shotgun and lots of abilities centered around lifesteal and bleeds. The more damage she deals, the more she heals herself. Her boomerang blade is used to apply bleed more than it is to deal tons of damage. Interestingly enough, her passive quick melee can also apply bleed. Her shift ability is a raid buff that gives herself a big health boost along with some added movement speed and a smaller health boost for allies. She can also swing a big axe that does 90 damage on impact and 40 bleeding damage. So that's a lot of damage. Her ultimate is interesting because on the surface it looks like a basic charging attack, but it also applies an anti-heal to enemies struck by it. You get the idea by now. Junker is a pretty simple character to understand. She's supposed to constantly engage and keep up the aggression on the enemy. That's what her whole kit's based around. Oh, that, was, that was a pretty short section. Have you seen this man? <gasps> Junkrat is, as far as I can tell, up there in the player frustration column for Overwatch diehards. Mainly because he can contribute a lot without a lot of aim. He still requires more aim than Moira, and his game is mostly about positioning and area denial. Junk's primary fire is a lobbed grenade that will do a good deal of damage to people directly struck by it, but it also provides a zone of damage and area denial on key objectives like a payload on defense. His satchel charge lets him move around the map, especially to obviously useful higher ground. Junkrat's got martyrdom from Call of Duty when he goes down, and he also doesn't damage himself with his own explosives, so he's not only good at providing his own of fire from a distance, he can also duel respectably well with said satchel charge, which also knocks enemies around. He puts a frost mat on the ground that will lock enemies in place to quickly be DPS down with a couple grenades. His ultimate is a respawn simulator that will insta-kill anybody within a pretty respectable range that can make the difference in a team fight, but it makes a lot of noise and it can be shot before getting blown up, so it needs to be deployed around corners or out of buildings for it to be effective. Kiriko is the newest addition to the collection of Overwatch's roster. Well, what do you think I was going to say? On She's the, the most nice mobile thing. healer in the game. She's suited to more aggressive play than you might think. Her right-click launches slow-moving kunai knives that deal kind of wimpy damage with body shots, but 120 headshot damage. These kunais are a great way to farm her ult, which I'll cover later. Her heal with left-click consists of ally-seeking paper slips that auto-aim to friendlies with line of sight. If your paper is blue, it means you spilled laundry detergent on it in the washing machine. Also, that's not how money laundering works. Did that joke make sense? It makes about as much sense as trying to heal your teammates through walls. You want it yellow. Kiriko can position herself in ways other healers have a tougher time with, thanks to a teleport usable on any of her teammates within the effective range. Teleporting on your teammate gives you LOS, which lets you heal them. And that's useful in a pinch, but you can also use it as a getaway tool while you farm your ult so that you can get back to your team safely. Kiriko has 200 HP and her right click is difficult to hit, making her an easy target for enemy flankers, so it's crucial that Kiriko has this TP not on cooldown when she takes engagements as a safety blanket. Kiriko is Japanese, and in the Overwatch universe, this gives you the ability to climb walls for more line-of-sight healing opportunities. She also has a throwable projectile cleanse that invulns those hit by it, provides a 50-hit point heal, and removes tons of debuffs like EMPs, sleep darts, purple anti-heal, etc. Yeah, it's really good. Use it on your tank. They will thank you for it. Kiriko's ult is a big zone on the ground that provides any teammates running through its speed boosts to movement, firing rate, reload speed, cooldown speed. It's a big team fight initiator and a huge part of Kiriko's kit. Be as mobile as possible, practice hitting those headshots. Farming her ultimate is crucial to getting mileage out of Kiriko, considering her healing ability is middle of the pack in terms of output. Our Farah is lost. <gasps> our Farah is so incredibly oh, both lost. Both our DPS are the randoms. <laughs> Lucio's healing is done in a big field around him, and as a result doesn't require that much mechanical right. input. Okay. Or does it? I'm on the mercy. Lucio is all about positioning and timing. Before you watch any more of this part of the video, here's what you need to do. Map knowledge is a big component of playing Lucio properly, because it gives him shortcuts and a really useful amount of mobility other supports don't have. He's not a big damage dealer, as is the case with many supports, but he has tools to help his team take big fights and to disrupt people that try to get in too close, particularly the right-click boop, which can blast a Reaper you don't want to kill your healer a safe distance away. Yes, I don't. Diva, let me know when you want to go for a dive. Soldier, top right. Soldier, top right. Damn, dive in top right. Okay. Ooh.
Nice. That's Lucio can amp up either a speed boost or a healing ability with E, and can shift between a speed boost or healing at any time. With the big AoE around him, Lucio gets the most amount of mileage when you're in close proximity to your team. His ult can make the difference in a team fight by providing a massive overheal to all of his teammates within the blast. Farmed with a four shot left click that doesn't travel very fast, but actually has pretty decent damage output if you can land those shots more up close. Lucio rewards paying as much attention as possible to the positions of teammates and enemies alike so that you can react accordingly and be where you need to be to keep teammates alive and enemies away from your key player. Help me! Help me! Gregor, where are you? Where are you? Uh, uh, what? What, do you what do you want? <laughs> I'm Lucio! I mean, we're fighting point, yeah. <laughs> well, I got isolated. I exist, I exist I and trying. I heal. That's what I do. I can't. I, there's no other input I can do besides that. Yeah, all you can do is stand there. I got <laughs> speared away what? by the Arista. <laughs> Thank you. She was away. fighting me. All right, well. That's okay. Ne I got my nade back. Next I got time, my nade next time back. in a 1v3, I'll, I'll be thinking about you, okay? Thank you. I appreciate that. The Great Wall of China! Behind that sweet, cuddly demeanor is a cold, calculating thing. It will destroy the positioning of all who tread where it may linger. Mei is a damage dealer with a number of mix-ups that can be used to really screw up the positioning of her opponents. She doesn't have a lot of mobility, though. To get out of tough situations, she encases herself in an invulnerable ice pillar where she can't do a whole lot except heal up if you keep shooting it. Mei's primary fire is great for keeping enemy Genjis from full sending on your healers since you don't need to have great aim to use it. Plus, it has the added benefit of slowing down enemies caught by its wake. The right click is a precision is so shot that can take out enemies with well-placed headshots. May's Ice Wall is probably the most infamous part of her toolkit and can be used to trap enemies for easy kills or to split up the team comp and force them to take a different approach. Her ultimate is a big AoE that does damage and freezes enemies in a big circle, which I don't really need to explain in depth too much. Just know that pocketing this for the right moment basically makes that team fight a free dub. She's not suited to flanking, but she's especially potent in death blob comps where she can enjoy the comfort and security of nearby allies to give her a safety blanket. I'm trying to get a Mercy Res and like... I don't understand, if, like, when, when we play the game, it's like Mercy's just fucking, they, they just, they just, okay, I pull up, hop out the No, they, they only pull up when pros here to complain about us not killing the Mercy. <laughs> Mercy is a character entirely devoted to healing friendlies and keeping them topped up, but she can also help do some damage, too. Her left click is a healing beam that needs established line of sight initially, but does taper off after a second or two of no line of sight, so you can be a little flexible with your positioning. Her right click amplifies the damage a little bit, if anybody, the staff is locked onto. She charges her ultimate from that boosted damage, which yeah. should tell you she's not no, particularly can't. suited to damage no, dealing at all, going. and her blicky should be used as a problem solver for emergency situations. Yeah, Mercy is suited to single target healing, not so much group healing. If you have one particular DPS you want to keep alive, Mercy is your gal. Obviously, you know about the pharmacy combo. She can fly around in the air towards teammates, but her ultimate allows her to have complete omnidirectional movement as opposed to that little short burst. She also has a res with a pretty short casting window. If the enemy has a mercy on the board, don't let them res for free. Did you guys hear me the first time? If the enemy has a mercy on the board, don't let them res for free. Mercy is priority number one for a smart team to take down, so you shouldn't take this job lightly. Position yourself well, and you'll be a huge help to your team. Truth. Hey Gabe. Uh, you must construct additional pylons. Systems online. Weapons. I don't even know what that means. Dick, you have the Protoss skin. You. Uh, uh, fake. Fake fan. A fake fan of what? Fake. Did I claim to be a fan of this? Just, what is I this that I'm referring to? A phony. So, because she's a Jirchen, so like you're really you're just kind of appropriating right now, to be honest with you. Bro, I'm gonna ban you. <laughs> Orissa is the quintessential frontline tank. She's got a big ass gun with no need to reload, a spinny spear ability that pushes enemies away while negating some damage, a spear that does a crap ton of damage to people caught by it while also pushing them back and doing wall knockback, an overhealth ability that negates headshot damage and makes her impossible to be slowed down by movement impairing effects, and a big teamfight ultimate that sucks enemies close to her to slam them with her spear. The ability can be charged up to do a crap ton of damage, or used early for a little bit less damage. At closer range, 
Her primary fire does more damage, so you're encouraged to really push the envelope and take fights with people up close. It can also headshot, so keep that in mind. She's not great at engaging multiple foes, though, as her abilities are more or less confined to single target damage. An interesting thing you can do with her overheal armored effect is you can use your big frame to body block friendlies. Orisa is probably the most straightforward tank in the game right now, and I'd recommend her as an easy pickup for new players who want to learn how to tank in Overwatch. This is the game. This though. is it. This is the game. Yeah, dude, it is a fun ass fucking game. It's it's called Quake Champions. Okay. And pe people right now listening going, God damn it, he's talking about, about that Quake again. again. Quake players, i.e., anybody born during the Clinton administration, will rejoice at Farah's design. Farah's got a jetpack. Okay. Can't get, can't get more complicated than that. It refuels automatically, but not fast enough to keep her in the air forever. So good timing is crucial to getting the most out of it. You should be in the air as much as possible. It makes it easier for your rockets to hit, and it gives you a better vantage point. You can chain this ability with a non-damaging knockback rocket for some crazy air and speed. Farah is basically the pressure hero. You'll be counterpicked by hitscan characters because it's just the easiest way to deal with your antics. But regardless, utilizing cover and navigating near it will help you considerably when it comes to dealing damage. In many cases, snipers in the backline will have to either respect the presence of your rockets or suffer the consequences. So even if you don't eliminate the target, you can make them easier to take down by forcing them away. The rockets are great at breaking up group targets and for wreaking havoc on the enemy backline. That's what Farah is all about. Her ult is a stationary ability where she basically AC-130s the crap out of the zone in front of her. Be careful though, it makes her a big easy target. <sighs> no. Yes. No. Yes. Stop posting cringe. No. Reaper's the tank buster of Overwatch. He's basically a hard counter to in-your-face dive tanks like Winston, and is usually an insta-swap the second he's on the board. The reason he's good at this is because not only does he have good damage output with his double shotguns, but he also has vampirism with the damage output. You want to get up close and personal and go for assassinations with Reaper when you're not shooting the tank. Don't use the Wraith form as an entry button, but rather as a disengage tool. Do your damage, and when your presence has been made, rave out, then repeat the cycle all over again. The teleport is very powerful for obtaining high ground very quickly, and can be used in equal parts to get you to the battlefield faster. You can also use it to escape when the need arises, and to go for much needed flanks. He's a very straightforward character that rewards good shot placement and quick thinking on your feet. His ultimate Death Blossom is powerful, but it can be shut down if the enemy anticipates it. What a Reaper should try to do here is get in the middle of a disrupted ball of enemies and take out as many low health targets as possible. On, you can kind our, of pre-fire uh, quote-unquote this ability by jumping from high ground. Once that's done, the tank should be easy pickings when the low health targets are down. Oh. Reinhardt's iconic, what can I say? He's been around for a hot minute. His most well-known ability is his barrier, which is very big and absorbs a whopping 1,200 hit points of damage. Reinhardt deals 85 base damage with his hammer swings, has a 90 damage ranged attack that can be used to pressure enemies off of spots he wants to fight, a charging ability that can slam enemies into walls, and a big damage stun that knocks down enemies in front of him, opening up team fights to be wrapped up in quick succession afterwards. His barrier is big enough to cover friendly teammates like healers, and his presence on the battlefield is made evident wherever he goes. The thing is, he's almost exclusively limited to close-range attacks. He has to be a team player, situated at the front of his team to allow them to take the map control that they want by any means necessary, or he's not going to get much leverage. Go back and forth with the barrier for defensive plays, and charge for aggressive plays, since you can actually cover a decent amount of ground with this ability. He excels at making quick work of enemies that get too close to his healers that he so heavily relies on with that big hammer. His job is to create space and make it easier for his team to maneuver around the map. Beware the hook! Uh-huh. I the hook! Roadhog's basic character design is to catch easy-to-frag targets out with his hook, tilting the engagement in a different direction right away. His biggest downside is that he doesn't have any barriers, but he does have a decent deal of self-sustain with his vape. No barrier might seem like a bad thing, but when you consider Hog's decent damage output and ability to get picks, he's a force to be reckoned with in skilled hands. He's a big target, obviously, so positioning yourself around corners to get the most out of your shotgun is critical. The shotgun has decent damage for a tank gun, and he also has a right-click that can be used to take out distant targets, a lot like the Bucky right-click in Val. Farming enough damage for your ult gives Roadhog a big-ass AoE spread gun that not only does decent damage, but also pushes people backwards, so it's awesome for CCing the objective. He needs to stick around his team and use his presence as a deterrent to keep people away from parts of the map you want to keep. Road might be simple to explain, but it's a bit more difficult in execution, as that chain hook doesn't exactly have a fast projectile speed, 
and smart players won't let you get away with hooks so easily. But if you find yourself the occasional DPS or healer hook, it's pretty much a guaranteed kill. To get the most out of Roadhog is to be a persistent threat with the hook. Sigma Male is a versatile tank with good defensive and offensive capabilities in tandem, but the downside is that his mobility is really bad. He has a versatile barrier, though, that can be deployed just about anywhere he wants with 700 hit points. The fact you can place it in the air allows him to block off sight lines other tanks can't really do. It gives your team a lot of space, especially from high ground angles occupied by windows. His primary fire is a set of blue balls that can bounce off of corners. They do a ton of splash damage and have good damage with direct hits as well. No reloads necessary. You throw two and then get two more right away. He can also literally send a rock flying at somebody and do 100 direct damage, plus do knockback. He's also got his own version of the suck, where he can absorb shots fired at him briefly to give him some shields. His ult is a zone ability that sends a bunch of bad guys into the air to send them back crashing towards the ground for a ton of damage. But abilities like May's Ice Pillar or Orisa's Fortify can negate the gravity effect. He can also float very high into the air and make himself a more difficult target to ascertain. Sigma's Barrier is arguably the most important aspect of his kit, considering it has great placement options and will give your team the flexibility they need to move around the map unscathed. The basic idea with Sigma is to be mindful of your ability's timings, considering they're all on big cooldowns, and you don't have good mobility options at all. Interestingly enough, he floats, so he doesn't make footsteps. Take that for what you will. Sojourn can squat more than you, which is not saying much because you play video games. Her thunder thighs aren't just great for carrying the weight of the team on her back, they also provide her with a great deal of mobility in the form of a slide, cancelable with a high jump. The slide can be used to initiate gunfights with important targets, evasive maneuvers to the side, or to back away to safety. Zoldrum plays like an old school arena shooter character with a gun that rewards her for taking fights aggressively at any range. But medium range gunfights are where she shines. Too far away, and her primary fire will be difficult to lead with. That being said, if you can get a hang for the projectile speed, you can melt bad guys, especially with headshots. Consecutive shots on them will charge up your railgun fired with right click. Headshots will make a charge faster. It can be fired at any point, albeit it will cap out at 100. You can one-shot a lot of squishies with a 100 charged railgun in the head. That charge decays when not taking fights, encouraging you to keep the pressure on. Her E is important to utilize, and probably something that's going to get nerfed in the future, considering she really doesn't have any downside. This projectile has CC, as well as damage. It fires straight in front of her, and can snare enemies, making them easier to hit with your railgun. Sojourn's ult is a perpetually recharging full charge of railgun shots for a brief period that will pierce through opponents. She rewards aggressive risk-taking, able to take engagements and back away from them if it's too dangerous with smart positioning. She's definitely an S-plus tier DPS, and I wouldn't be surprised if she gets nerfed in the future. I'm making overwatch. Move, I'm gay. Yeah, I need help with the free free Take this and have any healers. Thank Ted. Monkey dead, monkey dead. I gotta reload, guys. Monkey's dead. I'm staying right here. Okay. Maybe do it down. I got him, I got him. Lucio down. Get on there, get on there, get on there, get on there. Kill the Reaper, kill the Reaper. Sombra's pretty up there in terms of the Overwatch annoyance meter. A lot of people are calling for nerfs to this character and I can see why. Sombra is a harassment character through and through, with the ability to completely blow open the enemy's strategy either by disabling the abilities of individual players, briefly through her hacks, or the entire team with her ult. Sombra isn't great at team damage, but she makes up for this with the ability to take 1v1 duels. Get that pick and retreat immediately with a teleport when you do so. Hacking health packs increases the recharge rate, allowing you to get into the fight right away. Additionally, Sombra telegraphs where she's teleporting, so sometimes people can put two and two together and see that you set up at a health kit, so be wary. Sombra's weapon is only useful at close range. No alt fire, but she has the ability to go invisible, and that's where you can do most of your work. And if she focuses the tank with hacks, they'll probably have choice words to say in all chat. And if that happens, you're probably doing your job. She's a good counter to death blob comps that are reliant on grouping up and letting the tank be the frontline fulcrum for the team's engagements. Oh, you're dead. You're dead. 
also Metra is still zero fun to play. Metra's a weird character. Her long range DPS isn't particularly good, but her usefulness is more on the utility side of things. And her damage output is respectable too. So Metra will help you channel your TF2 NG vibes by putting up turrets and teleporters. In coordinated comps, you can get into some MLG flank Metra gameplay, which I won't cover here because I'm a bot. Just don't forget to use these things for you and your team. The turrets are easily destroyed, but when placed around corners, they force the enemy to turn their crosshair, and they don't do half bad damage output either. Harassing enemies who want to take map control hard and fast is your primary goal here. Her primary fire is my favorite aspect of her kit. It charges up damage the longer you do damage. It even works on barriers, making Symmetra, you guessed it, pretty good for sustained damage. That's the whole point. Her ult's a massive wall that cuts off enemy attacks while allowing you to shoot back at the enemy. And her mobility, aside from her teleports, isn't great. Tracer is probably the hardest DPS in the game to play. She doesn't even have a health rating of 200, she has a health rating of 150. Just to put that into perspective, Blizzard thinks that every aspect of Tracer's kit is too nimble and hard to kill to justify a 200 health rating. That should tell you everything you need to know. Tracer herself is a small target with unparalleled mobility through the usage of a series of dashes, three in total, that she can keep pocketed, charging over a few seconds apiece. The dashes are her tools to engage, and her tools to dash away. Hitting windows of tracer damage is like throwing a ball in football. Once you lose your chance, you can't throw it there anymore. Be careful though, it's spicy. It'll get picked, you'll get picked. So don't throw, literally, into double DPS coverage. Use your mobility to take aggressive risks and harass and maybe even pick backline healers or DPSs that have a hard time dealing with you in 1v1s. Her pistols are more like shotguns and can be reloaded by using her recall ability, which quite literally sends her back in time. You were at full health at the time of the recall proc, if you're lit up, you get that health back, and your guns are loaded. You can use this to get back to, my favorite, higher ground. Tracer's ult is a bomb that she can attach to enemies if she gets up as close as possible. But it's difficult to hit when you consider that everybody is going to try and react to your play as soon as they see you make a beeline for a squishy target. Constant mix-ups and harassment are the play for Tracer, and she requires a lot of tracking to get the most out of her. But she's one of the game's most well-known characters for a reason, and she's pretty fun to play once you get the hang of it. I told them. I'm a sniper, I'm a sniper, I'm a sniper. No. Widow is the game's stereotypical sniper character. Every FPS needs one, and Widow filled that gap. Unfortunately, everybody in every FPS game ever made wants to be a legit MLG pro Chris Kyle. Sniping requires a lot of mechanical aim in any game, but okay aim in Overwatch isn't gonna cut it. Good aim is gonna barely cut it. Exceptional mechanical aim is not a suggestion, it is a requirement to get good usage out of Widowmaker, since a headshot can be the difference between a DPS or a healer getting away to heal and fight once again. Widow can one-shot 200 health characters with that full charge, so it's important to make them count if you don't want to get bullied off of her. Widow's weapon will be in sniper mode when ADS'd. Un ADS'd, it's an automatic pea shooter that is used almost exclusively as a finishing weapon for up-close targets or as a last-ditch defense option. She has a grappling hook that is essential for her positioning game to get to safer higher ground positions that provide a vantage point for her sniper, as well as cover to safely disengage from. You can also do some crazy movement techs with it by jump key canceling. She also has a proximity mine that applies the damage over time and a wall effect to anybody who runs into its effective radius. Sometimes you can use it as a makeshift grenade. Her ult temporarily gives you and your entire team walls, which is super helpful for hitscan characters such as yourself. Apes together, strong! Monkey smash, monkey jump, monkey zap, monkey barrier, monkey dive healer. Smash healer! Healer gone. Happy monkey. Monkey, retreat! Heal, monkey! Happy monkey. Monkey do. Again. Winston's the most mobile tank in the game, capable of leaping a great distance to the enemy's backline to beat the ever-loving crap out of any pesky snipers or healers. He jumps in, causes some damage, then jumps out to repeat the cycle. He has to constantly be on the move to bring value to his team, considering he's not as beefy as you think, his health pool isn't great, neither is his barrier, although the shape of it makes for some interesting plays and zone pressure with his primary weapon. Winston's weapon is meant to harass and deter more than it is to frag, but at the same time, it is a hard counter to flanking characters like Genji or Tracer. Winston's ultimate brings him up to a big amount of health even when low, and it can be used to send people flying off of the objective you want to control. Getting this ultimate going regularly is going to be an important aspect of mastering this character. He's easy to pick up and play, but requires a lot of knowledge about the game in terms of positioning and timings for you to get a lot out of him. But he's one of the best dive tanks in the game, and he's super fun to play. The alt fire gives you a long range zap, by the way, giving Winston the ability to sniper monkey. Lightning bolt.
you're still gonna get yelled at for picking Hampton. I guess I'm not going into anything. So Zarya is really good. Don't shoot the bubble. Don't shoot the bubble. Uh, okay. Do you guys understand how hard impulse control is for some people? Zarya has successfully convinced me. If there's a way to overcomplicate something, people will do it. In all seriousness, Zarya is a powerful brawler. She basically creates a bubble that negates up to 200 hit points of damage on her person. If somebody shoots the bubble, it charges up her laser beam. She can also use this bubble on teammates. The bubble prevents hacks while it's active. So Sombra can't really counter it. Zarya's particle cannon does 95 damage per second while fully charged, and 47 while uncharged. So either way, this ability actually does pretty decent damage, even when it's not totally charged. It's just a crap ton of damage when it is charged. With right clicks, you can also send an explosive charge at a distance. If you have good tracking, it's easy. All you gotta do is keep your crosshair on the target, like a sentinel beam. Her ult's a giant sucko mode that pulls enemies into it to get lit up by explosive abilities in 0.5 seconds. It also does damage too, because that, you know, that wasn't good enough. Zarya is the progenitor of the Def Blob team comp. She's in a pretty good place right now with a respectable amount of hit points and defensive and offensive capabilities in equal parts. Probably one of the most straightforward characters to explain, oh, Zarya can die, but Zarya can die, Zarya can she die. requires some situational awareness to get the most out of her bubble placement. Tom. Stop posting about baller. I'm tired of seeing it. My friends on TikTok send me baller. On Discord, it's fucking baller. I was in studio origami, right? And all of the channels were just baller. Unlike another character in the game, Zenyatta is a great option for support players who want to add a little bit more fragging power to their comp. His healing output isn't crazy, but he makes up for it by not only dishing out potent damage of his own, but also helping his team secure picks. Zen is heavily reliant on line of sight to do his job, and Orb of Harmony will heal at a rate of 30 points per second, provided he keeps line of sight on his buddy. And Orb of Discord increases damage taken by his target by 25%. Again, if he maintains line of sight, that's the difference between 150 damage and 200 damage, just so you're aware. Got a Pharah harassing you? Pop a Discord and let Ash make short work of them. Monkey trouble? Without healers, Winston will get focused down real quick. Zen's primary fire isn't too bad either, and once you get used to the lead time, you can fry. But you can fry people even faster by charging up the right click and sending a bunch of these orbs at once, which too many people will get hit by. You'll be amazed at how much damage Zen can put out once you start getting tricky with this ability. It'll absolutely melt low health targets who want to keep peeking something. Zen's ultimate can be the difference between a team winning and losing in the most direct way possible, considering he basically just keeps everybody alive for a certain period of time. Some might be tempted to only use this ability for the big Kahuna Burger team fight, but if you're popping off on Zen, you can use this thing to leverage smaller fights as well. Zen is not very mobile, and he has a low health pool. All else fails, pop a Discord on the enemy, and give him a kick in the Discord notification. Your kick does more damage, and it knocks back. 